Well, hello. How you doing? Like my bow tie? Very dapper. Good to be here. I'm exhausted, but good to be here nonetheless. And I uh, hope that we have some fun sharing things about relationships. That'll be helpful to you. I'm going to be speaking to you uh, uh, from two books that I've written. Uh, one is entitled uh, Treat Him Like a Dog. And the other one's entitled Treat Her Like a Truck. And uh, we'll try and explain it as we go along. Also, I got a couple of scriptures I want to share with you that I think will be helpful. And uh, so let's start right off uh, with the scriptures. I, I've got, uh, I've, I found one of the best relationship scriptures ever that most people are not aware are relationship scriptures. Here it goes. This is back in Genesis uh, after God had sent uh, a flood to destroy all the people because they're so bad. And after all this happens, he says, whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. I said, what kind of relationship scripture is that? <laughs> well, I want you to think about it a little bit. God set a rainbow in the sky to remind who? Yeah, you're all wrong. Read it again. Who is he trying to remind? Himself. Himself. Ha ha! Isn't it fascinating? We hear stories so often uh, from the scriptures and oftentimes very simplistic versions of it from children's things where we constantly repeat the wrong thing enough that we think it becomes fact. You can look at this very verse where I just read to you twice where God says, I'm doing this to remind me and I ask you, who's he trying to remind? And we all say, us. He's not trying to remind us. And here's the fascinating thing about it is um, the first, I forget, six, seven times that the word remind is used in the Bible, it is God talking about reminding himself. Now, doesn't that seem rather odd? Now, sometimes people think, well, does that mean God has Alzheimer's? No, he doesn't have Alzheimer's. It's just that it is part of God's nature to take what is already in here and bring it to the front. That's what it is to be reminded. Something that's in there, but you got to bring it to the front to remind. What if the, what if the reason we need to be reminded so often about things is not a fault. See, we often think it's a fault. Sometimes we think we have to remind each other as couples, and we think either the guy is an idiot and can't remember anything, or, you know, there, there's something wrong, or she's nagging, or what if the need to be reminded is not a weakness, but a family trait? We are made in the image of God. And if God needs to be reminded, and I know some of you are still processing that. If God needs to be reminded, don't you think it makes sense that we too need to be reminded? In fact, as you read through the Old Testament, it's fascinating how many times uh, the Lord will speak and say, you know, I, and then I remembered my covenant with the people. Or the people would pray and say, oh, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, remember your covenant with us. In fact, even as Christians in the New Testament, when we're praying, one of the great ways to pray is to pray the scriptures, offer up the scriptures to remind God of his promises. It's what it is, all right? So if this is a normal thing. It's not because God's brain isn't working. It's just what you're doing is you're taking what's there that God has and you're bringing it to the forefront. Lord, bring this concern to the front. Remember your promises. Remember your commitment to me, O oh Lord, your promises to me, your commitment to us. And this is how, uh, even how we should pray. So now you know something's wrong 
when you go to where you have stuff stored and you open the drawer and there's nothing there. That means you got a problem that you can't remember. That's concerning. That can be a little scary. Why am I saying all this? Because oftentimes couples get so mad at each other that they have to remind each other about things. Why do I always have to remind him? Why are you always reminding me? Why are you always, and, you, and I'll tell you what, the couples who get along the best, I want you to think about this and, and, and watch for it over the next month or so as you observe people. Watch how the couples who get along so great are constantly reminding each other. They're always reminding each other. And they do it in a sweet way and in a fun way. It's the couples who don't get along. They resent having to remind each other. And they resent having to be reminded. Quit nagging me. <laughs> These are the people who struggle in relationships. We need to actually embrace something. If you want something from someone, you need to remind them. And here's the thing. You'll probably need to remind them forever. It is what it is. If you're the kind of person when you come in the house and one of your things is you tell your wife, when I come in the house, I want to kiss. Okay? Now, the couples who get along great, if he walks in the house and she's busy, the first thing he'll do is go, hey, where's my kiss? Right? And then she'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The couples who don't get along don't say anything. And he walks in and she didn't kiss me. And I had to remind her 10 times and she still doesn't do it. She hates me. I know she hates me. And you know, all this nasty stuff. Don't let that stuff eat at you. Whatever you need from each other, you're going to constantly need to remind each other. Is this making any sense to anybody? Yeah. All right, your whole marriage, you're going to constantly remind each other. Say, so why is that? Because we're made in the likeness and image of God. And if God needs to be reminded, I'm pretty sure you fall in the same category. And it doesn't mean that anybody hates you or whatever. It, what's important to you needs to be uh, brought to the forefront all the time because you're married to someone who's not you. Have you noticed this? You don't share, the, even the most compatible couples don't share all the same thoughts. They don't share all the same priorities. They're going to forget things that are important to you. And it doesn't mean they don't love you. It just means they do what people do, which is let everything else flood their minds and they forget. So I just want to encourage you as uh, you guys grow in your relationships, get really comfortable with reminding each other. All right? And you men, I know you hate being reminded. Quit nagging me, woman. Quit nagging. She's not nagging you. She's reminding you. All right? and put it in nice terms. And you'll find you'll get along with each other a lot better. And it'll be frustrating, you know, you'll have to, I was telling a, uh, a group this morning, you know, that they get, women particularly get so angry because they have to constantly remind men, you know. They say, pastor, why do I have to keep reminding him? Why do I have to keep pointing out the same thing over and over and over again? And I always say, because he's still breathing. <clears throat> Hang in there, he's gotta go eventually, all right? So I want to talk about some very basic things that are, in a sense, reminding you about some of the things you might already know. But it's good to bring these things to the forefront. Peter, in his epistle, said, you know, I know you know these things already, but it's good for me to remind you. See, that's why we read the scriptures. You don't just read the Bible one time and go, all right, that's a wrap. I'm done. All right? Now, I do that with other books. I generally don't take a book and read the same book over and over again. But with the scriptures, ah, no matter how many times I've read those scriptures, I keep reading them. Why? I need to be reminded. Always embrace the need for reminding and being Reminded. All right, so our next slide here. This is the cover of the book for women, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about the book uh, about men. 
uh, for man. But this was called treat him like a dog. Now, this sounds like an insult. In fact, every chapter in this book sounds like an insult. <laughs> but they're not designed to be insults. There are really keys on how to succeed with a man. You want to succeed with a man? You need to remember these things and practice these things. So let's take a look at chapter one. Treat him like a dog. Now, oh, by the way, unfortunately, we don't have these books with us because it's a pain to bring books into this country. And they give us all kinds of grief uh, with, with customs and stuff. You can, however, go to uh, my website, markgunger.com, and download the ebook version to these books uh, very easily. Or we're meeting with a publisher, hopefully, in South Africa here that'll eventually publish all these books. That would be the best deal. And I apologize for my voice sounding so weak. <clears throat> I'm getting over a cold. Nothing more exciting than having a cold when you have to talk to hundreds of people. But, uh, and we all know that when a man gets a cold, that's a near-death experience. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worse than the man cold. I'm dying. Ah! Although, in our defense, and who knows if this is really true at all, I read a study that said, uh, according to the study, men actually do suffer more from colds and flus than women. And all the women are going, no, you don't. Be kind, I'm wounded with my cold here. Okay, treat him like a dog. What does that mean? You say, Pastor, that's an insult. No, it's not. How do you treat a dog? You walk in the door and say, how's my baby? How's my little puppy? Oh, so good to see you. Give me your little... And you change your voice and you talk to the puppy and you reassure the puppy and you pick up the puppy and you hug the puppy and you pet the puppy. <laughs> and you don't remind the dog of his failures. You stupid dog, you pooped all over the floor yesterday. <laughs> no, we don't do that to dogs. Why? That's ancient history. Man, there's not a guy in here who's not thinking right now, I wish I was a dog. <laughs> Man, a little kindness. As soon as you see the animal, you change your voice. You do it intentionally. You're being kind to the animal. All right? Now, you need to be kind to your other animal which is your husband, all right? And be nice to him and say reassuring things to him. You know, men struggle a lot. Limit, women don't really understand. Men have extremely fragile egos. They really do. Uh, the truth is, uh, and, I, and I was reading some studies on this, that do you know that most men are always haunted by a voice in their head that says, you're a failure, that they just haven't figured out you don't know that you don't know what you're doing yet. It's just a matter of time before they discover you don't really know what you're doing and get yourself in trouble. And there's all these self-doubts and stuff. One of the wonderful things about home is it should be an environment where the self-doubts are calmed. Every man struggles with this. And that should be why you need to try to encourage him and make home a place where the doubts are calmed instead of exaggerated, instead of pointing out the failures and the shortcuts. Now, I get it. We all have stuff we have to talk to each other about that we don't want to talk to. And the whole reminding thing, I understand. But let there be an attitude of basic just kindness where this is a safe place, okay? Where you try to remind him that he's valuable and important. And one of the most encouraging things a woman can do to a man is to passionately make love to him. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, when I say passionately, that means as opposed to laying there and counting ceiling tiles. <laughs> All right, are you done yet? I mean, that's not exactly what he needs to hear. The whole relationship between a man and a wife, if you do this right, is to erase the doubts, 
erase the slate, make things comfortable for him so that he can go out again the next day and make a big difference in your collective lives. So treat him like a dog. Our next chapter, <clears throat> treat him like your employee. Well, now, pastor, that's insulting. You should never treat a man like an employee. Yeah, now just relax. It's a good thing. How do you treat your employees? If you're responsible for people in an office setting, when you come in, what do you do? You make it very clear what you expect from them. Every day. You don't walk into the office and your employees say, what do you want us to do today? And you go, If I have to repeat it, it's not even worth saying. <laughs> Every day I got to point out the things that need to be done around here. All right, they will call the nut house and drag you away. All right, you're clear with what you want from them. You're clear with what you expect from them. You don't just walk around. Well, you might. <laughs> it's hard not to think sometimes how come they can't see it. But that's why you're in the position that you are to, again, remind them of what needs to be done. It's not about tearing them down and humiliating them. It's about being very clear and inspiring them to do these things. All right, what's the next chapter? Treat them like a cab driver. Now, I don't know if you've ever ridden in a cab. You guys have cabs around here? Do you? I never see any. But when you get in a cab, what you do is you get in, you tell them where you want to go, and then you shut up. <laughs> if you are constantly reminding them, don't go that fast, put on your blinker, go this way, don't go that way, he will stop and throw you out of that cab. And then you're going to walk yourself home. All right. The reason I encourage this is because a lot of women, God bless their hearts, they, they want to micromanage everything. And it's not that he, enough for him to do it, he has to do it exactly the way you want him to do it. And this rarely ends very well. Because usually the way it ends is she gets mad and says, well, I'll just do it myself. And then she gets mad because she has to do everything herself. And she gets so mad about having to do everything to herself, she gets a divorce. And now she gets to do everything herself. What was the point of that? <laughs> now you're doing it with less money. All right? Do you know what women in this room have men who cook for them? The women who never criticizes how he cooks. You know how women in this room right now have men who clean for them and do laundry and different things, other ones who never criticize how they do it. Criticism is not a motivator for a man. It's just not. You know, women, maybe it is for you guys. It doesn't seem to bother you as much. I don't know what the deal is. I think if you felt criticized, you would try to change and do something about it. Well, men don't think in those if you criticize us in a certain way and make us feel like a loser in a certain area, we yield. I won't do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be in an area where I'm constantly reminded that I fail. All right? Reminds me of a few years ago, I was out, whatever, coming to work, and got home late. And I walked in and I said to my wife, hey, baby, can you make me something to eat? And she said, make it yourself. I said, come on, come on, you're a pretty lady, make me something to eat, you know. But she wouldn't hear it. So then I gotta make it myself. Now, I only know how to make toast and eggs. So I thought, I'll make some eggs. So I got the pan out, I got everything, start cooking the eggs, three seconds, she's over my shoulders going, well, don't use that pan. Well, don't turn it up so high. Well, don't flip it. Up. Then you do it. All right? Now, 
when you're in this constant mode of stressing out about things, it's not good for you. I try to encourage these ladies everywhere I go, relax. Don't be so tense about everything all the time. Do you know that women have way more health problems than men? It's true. The vast majority of it, doctors say, comes from stress. Ironically, you live longer. I had one man say to me, he says, Pastor, I, I know why men die earlier. I say, why is that? He says, we want to. <laughs> you can either let your children and your husband assist you with certain areas of life, or you can do everything yourself. You know, that's really your choice. Everything doesn't always have to be absolutely perfectly done a certain way. Some of you are absolute perfectionists, and I get it, it drives you crazy. But really, you, you, got, you need to lighten up a bit uh, and let people, let the family do things together. Everybody pull their weight uh, without, all the, uh, without all the stressing. Now, I know that as pastors, we're not to encourage things like drunkenness. But I tell the women in my church, you're not supposed to get drunk, but some of y'all could use a little, you know, once in a while, just to take the edge off, you know, just relax. Quit stressing out about everything. You want him to drive the ca ca cab? Let him drive the cab. Show the same respect to your husband that you would to a cab driver. What's our next one? Treat him like a child. Ooh, that's so disrespectful. No, it's not. How do you treat a child? The child can do no wrong. No matter what he does, he's still my baby. I, love, I mean, the kid could be an ax murderer. <laughs> and he's still my baby. I love my baby. By the way, it's usually women who visit their criminal sons in prison. It's true. The father saw. But never the moms. Why? Because the moms never give up. He's your baby. He could draw the most hideous looking picture ever. And you stick it up on the wall. To your husband, it looks like a nightmare from Elm Street. You know. But you're always celebrating, always encouraging, always trying to get the best out of it, which is great. Women have a great way of encouraging their children because they never, ever give up on their children. Uh, my mother was great like that, and my parents were crazy. They both were nuts, man. They're not here anymore. I'm pretty sure she's in heaven terrorizing everyone right now. But, she, but one thing, my, my mother was always an encourager. She always told us, you can do anything because you're a gunger. And we go, yeah, we're gungers. And I think I was at least 35 before it dawned on me, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but you know what? No matter how hard I struggled in life, I've always been haunted by the voice of my mother saying, get up. You can do anything because you're a gunger. Yeah! I still don't know what it means. But it's encouraging. You know, a lot of people are haunted because all they ever hear are voices that told them they were nothing. You're worth nothing. You're a failure. You'll never be anything. <clears throat> well, moms generally don't do that to their children. Sadly, they freely do it to their husbands. And very quick to point out their faults and their shortcomings. And one of the reasons, quite frankly, is they don't share the same level of commitment to their husbands that they do to their children. If you think in the back of your head, this man is replaceable, and so, well, I can get somebody else. I know, but it's just, that's a bad way to be thinking, you see. If you really think in terms of, this is my guy for life, this is how we're supposed to think. 
and then you stay committed to him no matter what and you encourage him and when he fails you kiss his boo-boos and you help him get back up again and when he draws ugly pictures or whatever he does you point out what a nice picture it is again this is encouraging this is what should draw a man to his home one of the reasons and, and it's just and I can't say this for everybody because some people have jobs that you got to work just ridiculous hours even pastors do and stuff but, but one of the reasons why some men don't go home is they don't want to they would rather stay at work where people respect them they would rather stay at work where someone's encouraging them someone's lifting them up you know don't don't fall into that trap you need to make your home a place of safety it would be great if you could learn to treat him like a child as my voice is slowly fading away here so sorry um, next one treat him like a stranger do you know we're the nicest of people we don't know if I were to introduce myself to you for the first time you'd be really nice to me Hi, how are you? Good to see you. La, 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 la. Now, I could be an axe murderer. I could have 12 people buried in my backyard. And looking at you is number 13. And you'll be sweet as pie to me. Do you know why we're so nice to strangers? We have no history. There's no record of wrong. Now, the Bible says love does not keep a record of wrongs. Sadly, a lot of people keep very detailed records of wrongs. Some of you can remember every little rotten thing that's ever happened to you since the womb. This is not helpful. I remember on January 23rd, 2003, the wind was coming out of the south about two knots per hour and you said I was fat you know keep short records with people don't remember all they're crazy let stuff go just let it go keep short records that's, that's why the bible says don't let the sun go down while you are still angry you see that's, that's why I like to get mad at night. <laughs> Gives me 24 hours to be angry. I can enjoy a little bit of it for a while. You know. But no matter how frustrated and stuff you are, and we can truly irritate each other, keep a short record of stuff. You know? But a lot of, a lot of people, man, every, every past offense is always coming out of the grave to them all the time like a you remember Michael Jackson's thriller every time sure there's a goblin coming out of the ground that's the way a lot of people live their whole lives oh there's that person I you remember he said something bad to me and oh he said I was fat and there's someone else oh, and it's just, stop what a horrible way to live keep short records don't try to remember all treat him just like you would a stranger. And then the next one. And by the way, I'm going to ask you to ask some questions in a second here so I don't have to talk so much. <laughs> uh, the next one is, push the button. It's there. There it is. Here's a bonus chapter in the book. Do not treat him like your girlfriend. Men make terrible girlfriends. We do horrible, horrible girlfriends. And one of the reasons that women are so angry at men is because they're not women. <laughs> and we don't think like women, and we don't respond like women. We don't want to listen like women. Now, of course, women accuse men of not listening, but in all fairness to the men, when women tend to tell what happened they don't just say what happened they tend to relive the event in excruciatingly painful detail 
In fact, it often takes them longer to tell you what happened than it did for it to happen in the first place. So, women say, well, well what do I do, pastor? He doesn't want to listen to us. Get, get some girlfriends. Get seriously. Find some other women and you guys can spend all afternoon discussing a five-minute event. And you'll love it. And it'll be wonderful. You can cry and hug each other. It'll be fabulous. Just don't expect him to respond and think like a woman. Women are sensitive by nature. They're caring by nature. They're inquisitive by nature. I like to ask lots of questions so you can drag out the five-minute event even longer. Men generally, we just don't do those things. And it's, it's not that we're evil. It's just that we're men. And I understand that we need to do our best to engage the girl. You do need to talk to your wife. You just can't ignore her. All right? A lot of guys, you never talk to the girl. You need to talk to her. You can't just ignore her. That's why some of your sex lives are so awful, you guys. You get up in the morning, you ignore her. You go to work, you ignore her. You come home, you ignore her. You watch the TV for three hours, ignore her. Then you climb into bed and say, come on, baby, let's get it on. Is that going to happen? <laughs> You're going to have to engage with the woman at some point. But as much, and just remember, when he's engaging with you, it's a little painful. It is. It kind of hurts. Because men generally don't do that. You know what men do when we hang out? We usually discuss nothing. And we enjoy it, right? We go do something and say, and, and the wife say, well, 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 how was Gary? Okay. <laughs> What'd you talk about? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, how could you be there for two hours and not say anything? That's what we like. <laughs> Seriously, one of my best friends was, and he became an instant friend. I was in uh, Australia. And I was just <laughs> telling Deanna, stand up, Deanna. Everybody, look at Deanna, pretty Deanna. Wave at the crowd. Oh. Right. So, so, so I was just telling Deanna that uh, oftentimes when you travel, people tend to talk you to death because they want to hear from you, right? And it is what it is. You just got to suck it up. But I said, the worst is Australia because they don't just chat. They grill you. It's like every encounter with a pastor is like a job interview. You know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite book? What's your favorite this? And I'm thinking, oh, stop. But you got to smile. You know, you got to do it. So Anyway, I got this one pastor to take me downtown. It was like a 45-minute trip, whatever. He was a real tough guy, real nice guy. You know, he used to he do he does those triathlons and things. You know why anybody would do that? I have no idea. <laughs> I ain't running if nobody's chasing me, man. I'm telling right now. <laughs> yeah, so we get in the car and we're driving, and ten, fifteen minutes goes by. He doesn't say a word to me. 25 minutes goes by he doesn't say a thing about 40 minutes into the trip we're almost there he hasn't said a single word and I looked at him and said I really like you man <laughs> <laughs> we became good friends ever since why he didn't say anything you know it's just different than the female world again you can't just do that to your wife. You need to step it up. You need to connect. You need to talk. You need to do all these things. But no matter how hard he tries, ladies, he will never be your favorite girlfriend. He just won't. I know you need to do all these connection stuff. What you really need to do is find a nice girl that you can talk to without being competitive with. 
by the way, all the time. All right. Anybody have any questions about that stuff so far? Any questions about anything? My voice isn't working, so I'll sit there for 20 minutes. I don't care. You know. <laughs> Questions about anything, about relationships. A woman says, yeah, but what about this? Or what about that? Or what if you feel this way? Seriously. Oh, come on. The last time I was here, we had a blast doing this. I got grilled by all kinds of people. It was highly entertaining. You found somebody? There we go. Thank you. I just want to find out, because now you mentioned how we mustn't be nagging. How do you now effectively communicate <laughs> something that grinds you? For instance, you made an example about don't tell him, flick the indicator when he's driving. But at the same time, I don't want to die. <laughs> how, how, I mean... <laughs> That's not dramatic at all. No, no. It doesn't. <laughs> so how do you effectively communicate then when there's stuff that, that is endangering your life, basically? Because he was busy saying, mm, mm, you can't tell me how to drive, but at the same time, I really don't want to die. And there's plenty of other stuff like that. Okay, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's what I remember from last time. That's awesome. That's good. What do you mean you're going to die? <laughs> when he's driving? Yeah. Okay, not necessarily bad driving, but there's... Oh, wait a minute. I've driven in this country. Everybody drives bad. <laughs> <laughs> they don't use their turn signals either. And stoplights, which you call robots which I have no idea why. <laughs> you know, the first time when I came here, for two days, I kept looking for the robots. <laughs> a mechanical men by the side of the road. You know. <laughs> so, where are the robots? I keep turning at the robots. So, most of the robots are kind of general suggestions. <laughs> I've driven with some of y'all. That red light just goes zoom right through it. I go, Okay, I guess that one didn't count today. I don't know. Was... So you actually feel endangered for your life. You do, really, seriously. Uh -huh. Sometimes I do. And, and, and that's his fault? Oh, who's, who's the husband? Over here. <laughs> well, these questions are just theoretical, of course. You know. <laughs> do you drive like a crazy man? Yeah, I do, I do. I you do? do. All right. Do. Do. You ever get in an accident? Um, no, I haven't been in an accident. Of my How old are you? Uh, 29. 29. Yeah. So for 29 years, you haven't killed anybody yet. No. I don't want to be the first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be the first. <laughs> you, you ever ride in a cab? Sorry? I'm asking, have you ever ridden in a cab? Yeah, yeah, I have. Do they do everything they're supposed to do? There was one particular one who didn't, but I asked him to calm down. <laughs> you asked him to calm down? Yeah, because he was just speeding and overtaking cars, and I felt my life was in danger. Oh, did he calm down? Yeah, he did. All right, he didn't get mad about it? No. All right, so you're a nice lady. You can ask things in a nice way. Actually, I was in a cab once here. You guys ever see those video games like Grand Prix Racing? Man, it was just like that. They, he, this guy was driving like a bat out of hell. I mean, going. E -e -e. My wife, the whole time, and I, we wouldn't look forward. We just had our heads bowed. Oh, Lord Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> Every time you look up, oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. So, uh, can, do you drive? Yes, I do. Yeah? Does he not let you drive? No, he lets me. Okay, so 
if he drives and you're going to die, <laughs> and you drive and you're not going to die, why don't you drive? <laughs> Sometimes I'm tired, you know. We'll oh, come on! <laughs> we'll you said your life is in danger. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if your life is in danger, you're going to wake up. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Just face it, you don't like the way he drives. That's fine. You, know, you can encourage him. Does it bother you when she says that stuff to you? Um, sometimes, yeah. 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 I would just say, you know, woman, let me drive. That's what I said. Or you can drive. I don't know. It's fine. He doesn't want to drive. Do you, you don't want to die, do you? No, nobody wants to die. You know, I'm an, I, I fly airplanes. And uh, people always say when I'm flying an airplane, you know, make, make sure you're paying attention up there. Oh, I'm paying attention. I don't want to plunge to death from 28,000 feet. You know, I just, it's a high motivator. But people do things differently. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. Be as nice as you can. Start out nicely. Do a reward system. Okay. Yeah. Say, hey, baby, you get me to where I need to go without scaring me, and I'll have a surprise for you later. <laughs> and see what he does. You know? But literally, I mean, if you're really that terrified, I would, and he doesn't mind, I just drive yourself. It's fine. Say, so, well, I shouldn't have to. I mean, that's, everybody always says that, right? I shouldn't have to. Sometimes you have to. It'll be fine. Anybody else? That was great, by the way. So, Mark, hi. Just to work on this, uh, this, this, what do you talk, this uh, reward thing? Yeah. So, <laughs> so we could technically use that to our advantage. Yes. I want to be driving so badly from now on. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I know it drives women crazy, but men are motivated by rewards. It's kind of like treating him like a dog. The way you get dogs to do things is, you, what do you do if he does the right thing? You give him a treat. It's true. He gets Because guys like to. The reason why men go to work is because they pay us. Believe it or not. If they didn't pay us, we ain't going. You know, Everything we do has some kind of a reward tied to it. It's kind of the world of men. So usually you can either yell and scream at them, see how that works for you, or try little cute things. Anybody else? Okay, we'll take a break after this. Uh, good evening, Mark. Um, good evening. We've been engaged for two years, and one of the things that's... Wow, 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 wow. Clearly, we have never met. How long have you been dating? Uh, two and a half years. Two and a half years? And you've been engaged for two and a half years? Uh, Courtney. Is that right? Yeah, it was her decision. She wants to be engaged for three to four years before. Why? I just, I feel that we're still quite young, so there's not that... You're still quite, quite what? We're still quite young. I'm 25 and he's 26. Oh, for the love of Pete. <laughs> Clearly, you've never heard me speak on this subject before. And, and it's okay. I got married at 18. People say, why did you get married at 18? Because it was against the law at 17. You know, and, 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 and not, to, not just to pick on you, but it's the, whole, it's the culture. It's the culture you guys live in. All you guys at your age, for some reason, think you need to wait, 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 as if in your 20s is, is too young. And I'm just telling you, it's, it's just patently absurd. It's, you're not too young. Do you know how old theologians think the Virgin Mary was when she gave birth to Jesus? 14. For thousands of years of human history, people wed very early. Now, for some reason, y'all are waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I don't understand why. I mean, if you love each other, just get married. Unless he irritates you constantly, I can see why you'd want to delay. <laughs> but if you want to be together, I know you haven't even asked me your question yet, but I'm just saying. D <clears throat> 
don't do it. No, seriously, your whole generation, it's make, your guys are making a, a, a terrible mistake. You really are. And it's not just you. I get it. It's the whole generation. And I've never seen it worse than in South Africa. People, you guys are married very late. And I'm not sure why, uh, what, the, what the thinking is. Uh, but one of the main problems that couples like you have is uh, uh, sometimes having children. Because you wait so long. You wait and you wait and you wait. Your body doesn't care that you want to wait. At some point, it gets really hard. And then I have couples say, well, we need money. So they wait for money, 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 money. They finally get married. By the time they're 32, have their first kids. Try to have their first kids by 35. They can't now. So they spend all the money they have trying to get pregnant. <laughs> what was the win here? I don't understand. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, what was your question? I never got <laughs> it. It, um, it, it just, it really frustrates me. I do, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be mean, but there's no reason in the world to drag things out that long. And the truth is, are you guys Christians? Or are you just? I'm Christian. She's Buddhist. She's what? She's Buddhist. I'm Christian. She's Buddhist. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, different value systems. If you want to do this thing right, uh, you'll, you, you need to do it right. And if you de delay, you're going to be doing things you shouldn't be doing, quite frankly, unless you're made of steel. Uh, and, uh, there's, there's lots of reasons. But anyway, okay, so you had a reason. You're dating for two and a half years, and your question is? So we moved in together, and we started having problems with finances. She's really of the old belief that the man must pay for everything, and I'm of the new belief. I don't mind paying for more than the lady, but I can't afford to pay for everything because everything's skyrocketing. And she believes I'm not a proper man if I don't pay for everything and I'm not a provider so I just wanted to ask you what your view yeah <clears throat> really I, I, I'm glad you guys came I you know I really I really am I'm glad and, and I obviously don't think the way you think and don't agree with what you do but the problem is you're just you're playing house and you're trying to be serious while you're playing house and it's just when you do marriage it doesn't become my money and your money anymore it becomes our money. Somebody say amen. amen. See? And you're like, you need to pay for this, and you need to pay for that. You know, no, no. Not if you're really going to be together, when you marry, which apparently you're waiting for the moon to turn different colors before you do that, <laughs> then uh, you're, you're in a state of, it's, it, you're just in a bizarre state. There's, there's no rules for what you're doing. It doesn't just make it sense. You're, tr you're trying to shack up. You're trying to do life. You're acting like a married couple, but you're not a married couple. There's not an answer for you. You just, that's why you don't do these things. Ideally, because everything is about competition and who's doing what and who's sharing. Once you're married, it's our money. It's our life. We do everything together. That's the power of marriage. All right? And I always encourage men, generally, let the girl win. Why men just don't let girls win? I don't understand. We have some of the stupidest arguments about money, about this and that. And I always tell guys, just let her win. Well, I don't want to let her win. Why not? Just let her win. Do you care? Guys get mad with She moved the chair, and I don't want that chair moved. Let her win. People say, why do you let her win? Because I want to get laid. <laughs> I do. I'm a big fan of that. And if you're ticking her off, my chances of getting laid diminishes dramatically. Why men just, I don't understand men, why you guys argue about stuff. Honestly, who cares? Let the girl win. There's a saying, happy wife, happy life. Okay? The challenge you guys have is you're kind of husband and wife, but you're not, and, and, and the rules don't work, and it's all kind of jacked up. So anyway, thanks for that question, though. Oh, we're going to take a break. Yeah. All right, so friends, thanks, Mark. Can we give Mark a round of applause? <laughs> Continuing. Now I want to talk about this book. Again, you can get these books online. Download them very simply. And uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to get these books <laughs> in the country eventually. But it's a fun little book. And there's a lot of stuff. I'm just giving you little highlights from each chapter. And there's other chapters. I'm just skipping over a lot of them. 
for example, one of the chapters in the dog one is treat him like a gynecologist. And I uh, <laughs> thought, thought I'd skip that for tonight. So anyway, uh, so let's look at the next book. This next book is called <clears throat> Treat Her Like a Truck. So you go to the next slide. Here's the guys working on the truck. Now here's, here's the thing about guys and trucks. We tend to take care of them. You know, if you feel a weird shimmy in the, in the steering wheel, you get it checked out right away. If a red light goes off, you check out, see what's, what's going on. Uh, if, you know, smoke's pouring out of the engine, you investigate what's going on, right? You're always checking, you're careful because of the investment that you got in this truck. And some of us have old trucks. I drive a really old truck, old rusty uh, GMC pickup truck. And uh, I'm, I'm one of these guys. I know a lot of people like really new vehicles. You guys in this country, everybody drives a nice car. They really do. It's very impressive. All the BMWs and stuff like that. I drive a, a piece of junk. It doesn't start right, right? I finally got it to start again, so I'm good. Yeah. So uh, you say, why do you do that? Because I'd rather spend money on other stupid things. So anyway, uh, the thing about trucks and stuff like you take care of them. Now, here's the problem with a lot of guys when it comes to their marriages. They don't pay attention. They don't pay attention. In fact, it, this is how dramatic it is. If a woman comes to me and tells me that her marriage is in trouble, 80% of the time, at least 80% of the time, can totally save the marriage. Whenever a man comes to me and says his marriage is in trouble, in all the years I've been doing this, I don't think one time we've been able to save it. The reason is, is because by the time a man finally says something, it's too late. He doesn't pay attention. That would be like driving your truck, every red light is on, smoke's pouring out of the thing, oil's burning through the, you know, before you finally take it to the mechanic. Well, the mechanic say, well, you're, it's toast. I can't do anything now. Don't be like that. Pay attention, okay? Don't just get in your own little world. Oh, oh, don't bother me, woman. Because at some point, if it gets out of control, you're not going to be able to save anything. Pay attention. Treat her like your truck. Next chapter. <clears throat> Treat her like a sports car. <laughs> now, here's the thing about sports cars. They like to advertise the sports cars, and they show you the great footage of driving the sports car, and they want you to come in and take a test drive and stuff, you know. The reason advertisers spend the money they have <clears throat> is they know something you don't, which is this, that desire follows attention. If you will pay attention to something, you will start to desire it. Well, a lot of the reasons that a lot of men lose the passion and desire for their wives is for no other reason than you quit paying attention to her. You don't look at her anymore. You don't acknowledge her anymore. You do that, I'm telling you, your heart's going to grow cold, and then you're going to start thinking about things you shouldn't be thinking about and bad choices and stuff. You want to put some fire back into your marriage? Watch the girl. Look at the girl. Now, that doesn't mean stare at her. It'll, it'll creep her out and she'll smack you. But, uh, but when she's not looking, watch her. Watch her when she goes around the house. Watch the way her hair falls on her shoulders. Watch how the light moves across her cheeks and her nose. I promise you, something will start to stir inside of you again. It's called desire because it's a law, just like there's a law of gravity. I step off this platform, I'm going down. I love dealing with laws because laws are, are bigger than us. You know, sometimes there are things that to make things happen, you've got to be really spiritual or really smart and stuff like that. Well, the thing about laws is they just work all the time. That's why the law of gravity works whether you're smart or not. Whether you've prayed all day or today or not, whether you read the Bible today or not, it's a law, it just works. Well, there's relational laws, and I like to hang on to those because it surpasses what I do. And one of the laws is if you will pay attention to that woman in your life, you will start to desire her. So if things are getting a little cold in your heart towards her, and you think, well, because she does this and she does that, or, ah. no, no, no. Pay attention to the girl. Keep your attention to her because the more you pay attention, the more you will desire it. It's something that advertisers from sports cars to everything else under the sun, they all know 
Get them to pay attention, and they'll want it. It's the way it works. So treat it like a sports car. Next one. Treat it like a television. Another thing with televisions is uh, when I like to watch television, I, I hate distractions. Uh, you know, like people who keep talking during the movie. You know, maybe somebody does, it just irritates me, you know. Shut up. I'm trying to watch the movie. I have a, my son-in-law, Ross. He drives me crazy because he, he never shuts up. And if I'm watching a movie, he's discussing things. Shut up. I don't want to hear this. And, and he can't stop. He's like he's possessed. And he's just like, oh, la, 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 la. And then if I can find Ross, shut up. Then he'll sit next to me and he'll do this. <laughs> Will you stop it? I'm not talking. I know, but you're wiggling your foot. He's got all this nervous energy. And I'm like, <laughs> just so distracting. So what do you do with your television? You give it your undivided attention. When you are talking to your wife or she's trying to talk to you, Give her your undivided attention. Now, in all fairness, if you're talking all the time, that can get a little old. All right? So give it to him in short bursts as much as you can uh, because, you know, they can only handle so much. But pay attention. And, and here's a rule, ladies. Generally speaking, if a man is not looking at you when you're talking, he ain't listening to you. All right? And you guys know this as well. When she's talking, she's trying to say, look at the girl. Pay attention to it. Just like your TV said, eh. All right? Then you'll be able to get more information. You'll be able to collect more. It'll be better. And it's just a polite thing to do. Again, if you're constantly talking, that'll be very hard for them. And then women say, but I want to talk. That's where I say, get a girlfriend. Talk till you drop. And then you'll be fine. So give her your full undivided attention, just like you are when you're watching television. Next chapter, actually, we're skipping chapters. Just treat her like a teammate. Now, here's the thing about teammates. Uh, they don't all do the same things, okay? Um, now, I don't know much about uh, your sports over here. I, I certainly don't understand uh, cricket. It's, it's like a slow death to me. I don't understand. Uh, it's like watching an entire crowd of people slip into a coma. I'm not sure. I don't, so I don't understand any of the rules. So I have no analogy there. Uh, I, I don't understand soccer, which you should call football. I don't get it. When you play for all that time and it ends 0-0, zero, zero, it's like, what was the point of that? I don't understand. You know, it's 0-0. Zero, zero, and I'm like, all right. So anyway, uh, rugby, I like rugby because they're all beating the snot out of each other. It's highly entertaining. I, like, I love going to rugby games. I don't understand the scrum, though. I've had people explain it to me all the time, and I don't get it. It just sounds like it hurts. I, I don't know what the point is. So my only analogy is American sports, okay, like American football. So now, football, you've got the quarterback, you've got the lineman, you got it. You know, everybody does something differently. You don't all have to do the same thing. And in fact, it is the insistence of everyone doing the same thing where things get out of trouble or get confusing, like the sweet couple that were just saying. They were, they're living together, but they're arguing about what's mine and how much it pays and stuff like that. You know, uh, you know, those things get complicated. At some point, you've got to just be in 100%. Once you're in 100%, then everybody does what they do the best. Don't try to make everything even. There was a study that just came out this week that showed that couples who divide chores equally around the house have the highest divorce rate. Isn't that amazing? Because well, a lot of men go, well, then praise the Lord, man. I, I ain't doing jack, you know. No, it's not that. It's, not that. it's, it's just they, uh, they, they, they think everything has to be even all the time. Everything's got to be exactly the same. I do this much and you contribute that much. It's, you know, it's just, it's just a weird way. It doesn't work. Do what you do really well. And sometimes 
you know, the church isn't particularly helpful when we talk about marriage, you know, and we say that, you know, the man is supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home. We've all heard that, right? But ironically, the Bible never says that. It doesn't say who's supposed to be more spiritual than the other person. If you're more spiritual than your husband, you yelling at him would be more spiritual. Is it going to help? You know, who is or who is not spiritual is irrelevant. Or sometimes they think, because he's the man, he, he should handle the finances, Pastor, because he's, he's the man. No. Stop. All you got to ask yourself is who's better with money? For example, if you're good with money and your husband can't, you know, add better that you handle the money right so and this is true with business partnerships business partnerships where people try to do everything exactly the same 50 50 they always fail the best business partnerships is where people do what they do really one is great at marketing and sales and the other one's great at making the stuff that's it they don't do the same things they're not even trying to do the same things they do what they do best so in your marriage Find out what you do well, and you do it. They say, well, then I'm the one who always has to do it. Well, so what? The quarterback's always the one who throws the ball. You know, the other ones don't get to throw the ball because that's not their role. All right? Everybody has their role, and everybody does what they do to the best of their ability. It's what builds the team. Someone does their role better. It inspires others to do their roles better, and the teams perform at a higher level. So that's what that's talking about. Don't, don't try to make everything even and everybody has to do the same in any sport. Again, I don't know the names for your different roles in some of your sports, but if everybody played the same position, like, like what's, a, what's, a, what's a position in soccer? A forward? Do you guys have forward? Huh? A striker. What the heck is a striker? A goalkeeper. They call that striking? What's a striker? A, a goal, no, he's giving you two different goal positions. <laughs> goalkeeper. All right. Everybody can't be the goalkeeper. Because then if you do that, the score will be 0-0. Zero, zero. So I, I don't know. I just, just, I'm sorry. It just doesn't work for me. I don't get it. Everybody's huddling around the goal. There's no ball on the field, but we're all being the goalkeeper, okay? Or the striker, whatever that means. So uh, don't, everybody doesn't have to do the same thing. Don't envy each other uh, when you feel like, I always have to do whatever. It's just a bad place. A lot of the reasons that you might do something is sometimes you're just better at it. Uh, you know, my wife, my, my wife, by the way, uh, died last year. I don't know if you all know that. Uh, breast cancer. Uh, it was very, very sad. But, uh, you know, we never tried to do everything equally. Uh, there were some things she would never let me do, like touch the laundry. <laughs> Apparently, you can't put red things in with white things. Then they all turn into pink things. I didn't know that. You know, so <laughs> she made a very quick decision. Leave it alone. <laughs> I'll do it. You go find something else to do. All right? So that's teammates all working together. They celebrate together. They do the best they can. They're always trying to improve themselves because when they improve themselves, it helps the team. And then, of course, the most important thing, teammates always smack each other on the butts. All right. <laughs> don't don't want to forget that. All right. So treat her like a teammate. Next one is treat her like a baseball glove. Again, sorry with the American sports here, but uh, you guys understand baseball at all? Okay. It's, it's like a version of cricket without the coma. Okay? So, so, so here's the thing about a baseball glove. Nobody likes, no man likes to play with a new baseball glove. You don't like it. They like the old baseball glove, the familiar one, the one that's flexible. In fact, if you buy a man or a woman, some women play as well, a baseball glove, the first thing they start to do is beat the snot out of it. Break it, and trying to, you know, put oil in it. They want to get it dirty. They want to get it familiar. They love 
They love their gloves. These guys will play with the same gloves their entire careers because it's flexible and it's familiar and there's great power and, and, and an ability in that which is flexible and familiar. The analogy here is, and I say this to men all the time, don't, don't get caught up in the Hollywood nonsense that you need a new wife, that for things to be better, you need to find a new woman, you know, because Hollywood, first of all, they're all crazy, these people, and they don't know anything. For people who make romantic movies, they're the dumbest people on earth. And these are people who can't stay married for more than a week and a half themselves anyway. They always say, you got to have something familiar. you got to jack it up. Oh, nothing like the one-night stand. Which is absurd. And Hollywood always makes it look so amazing. The one-night stand and the music. Oh, oh, oh. And it, oh, oh, it was so amazing. Which is nonsense. First time sex with anybody, at best, is awkward and a little embarrassing. And, and I tell the girls in my church, the young girls, I do it on Sunday morning because I'm in charge. <laughs> I tell the young girls, do not, do not buy into the lie that losing your virginity is a wonderful, magical thing. That's what they tell them in these movies. The most wonderful night of their life is when they lose their virginity. Ooh. It, that, it's not like that. I tell them, go talk to other women. It ain't like that. Usually the first time is like, what was that? You know, it's a little disappointing to say the least. It, it takes a while to get the hang of it. Don't sell out for something that's a lie. And you men don't always be thinking, oh, what I really need to do is spice it up is find somebody new. No, 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 no. And the University of Chicago did a big study on, on sex and because in America we're, we're perverts. But anyway, so uh, they wanted to know which women in America had the best sex. Well, they all thought it'd be the single girls, right? The young ones in their 20s and stuff. They actually rated at the bottom, very bottom. What shocked the researchers was the women who reported having the best sex were religious women with three or more children. Why? Things get familiar. Things get flexible. See, it's, the familiar is what is the best part of this. It makes it wonderful. It's like, well, well, sex gets boring. Look. <laughs> if sex is boring to you, there's something wrong with you, okay? You're probably overstimulated. There are people actually who have too much sex, believe it or not, and it becomes boring to them. They gotta do something crazy, like these idiots. <laughs> this guy in North Carolina, I don't think he was a particularly smart guy. But uh, he had read somewhere that if you run an electrical current through your body, it will increase their orgasm. Uh, I assume they meant like a low DC current. You know, first of all, if you're going there, you're a little nuts, all right? Well, this guy, he didn't quite grab the difference between AC and DC. And, uh, and he, he clips two wires to his wife's nipples which ow who clips things to that and, and then he plugs it in the wall he kills her instantly yes he felt terrible I don't think they even prosecuted him I think he's just he was an idiot who does we're just trying to have sex and I read somewhere so, so he zaps her as other people, they, 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 they got to keep jacking things up. Well, if you're trying to jack things up, doing something, you're, you're, you're too stimulated. You know, the Bible actually talks about fasting sex. It does for a period of time. It's just stop. If you're to the point where it's boring to you, just back off for a while. Things will come roaring back to life. But I've never understood this, I'm bored with sex thing. You know, I've been bored. 
I've, I've been in church and been bored out of my ever-loving mind. I've been in church listening to the preacher and so bored, and, and I was the preacher. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the bad sign when, when you can't stand what you're saying. That's a horrible sign, all right? But you don't need to be dragging somebody new in. It is not an answer. Nothing beats, even the studies show it, nothing beats the familiar. It's the one. Then these stupid idiots in Hollywood, you know, they promote these one-night stands and say, well, of course, you got to wear a condom. Condom. Anybody who uses the word great sex and condom in the same sentence is an idiot. Really? Sex with a condom is like trying to eat an ice cream cone with a sock on your tongue. <laughs> hey Amen. I mean, this is your version of great sex? So, so that's what they think is great sex. Wrapping cellophane around themselves and climbing in bed with some stranger. You don't even know their name. I'm telling you, it's a lie. Don't listen to that lie cherish the familiar somebody say amen. amen all right next one treat her like your job <laughs> now here's the thing with a job whenever you go to get a job we always act like we are the best person on earth for this job right everybody sells themselves you gotta really be confident you know no i'm i'm your person i'm the man for this job so you get the job and then the bad news is now you have to actually do something. And you have to perform. So a lot of guys, they're great at the dating part of, of the relationship. And selling themselves as something really special for the girl. But at some point, you got to perform, man. You got to start being the guy you promised to be. So just don't sell yourself as something wonderful and then ignore her after you get married. It happens a lot. You know, a lot of guys, when they say, I do, they think it means I'm done. And they stop. And it makes things worse. You have to keep performing. Just like your job. You quit performing at your job, you're going to get fired. You'll get dismissed. It's the way it is. Same thing in your marriage. You can't just ignore the girl and think everything is going to be okay. It's not. You have to perform and be the person you said you were going to be. Actually, I was telling uh, someone the other day, I, I, I was in uh, northern Wisconsin, where we live, and much north further than us is nothing but trees and squirrels and stuff. You know, it's the middle of nowhere. But in Wisconsin, there's bars everywhere. Everywhere. We are the drunkest state in the Union. Everybody has to have something they're proud of. All right, so apparently that's ours, our claim to fame. We drink too much. But anyway, you can go to whole towns. Nothing is in the town except a bar and a post office. That's it, all over the place. So we stopped at one of these bars. We were wanting to get something to drink, something, something to eat. And we pulled and we're sitting at this counter and talking about relationships because that's what we do. And this bartender uh, who doesn't claim to be a religious man at all, I mean, nothing, He's listening to us, and then he finally chimes in, and he says, you know, I've never been, I've never gotten my, my wife upset about anything. And we looked at him and said, oh, come on. He says, no, nope, never have. We don't believe you. He says, ask her. She comes walking in. said, has he ever been mean to you, ever got you upset in any way? She says, Never. And then he looked at us and he said, you know, I made a promise. I told her, if you will marry me, I promise I'll never be mean to you. Oh my, and he kept his word. Isn't that amazing? See, a lot of times we, we say things, but we don't live up to our commitments. You know, now, we need forgiveness because not everybody can pull off what the bartender pulls off, that's for sure. But, you know, be a man of your word. You said you're going to do the job. Do the job. Perform. Gave it the same kind of attention you would your job. And to remember, 
if you quit performing, you're going to get fired. And it's amazing how many men get served divorce papers and they are shocked. Shocked! Like they had no idea it was coming. They're not doing their job very well. <coughs> What's the next one? Treat like a great adventure. <laughs> Anybody here never been on a safari? Raise your hands. Anybody? Never? Oh, so you guys do that here. That's good. You, you'd be surprised in America how many people live by certain great things and they never do it. There's people who live like two miles from the ocean and have never been to the ocean. You go to Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and you talk to the locals and almost no one has ever gone to Pearl Harbor to see things. There's people who live by the mountains who've never been in the mountains. It's amazing. We just take for granted the familiar. You know, you got all this stuff and, and you keep ignoring it. There's people, people in New York City who have never been to the Statue of Liberty. Never. Their whole lives, they see it. But they have people from all over the world come there to go up in it, but they don't bother. That's close enough, you know. Uh, when you go on a vacation and you're doing some great adventure, you plan things out. You want to make sure you go to these places and see things, you know. You don't just go to a vacation. Well, you shouldn't go to vacation and you get there and you go, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. I don't know. Let's get a sandwich. You know, I don't know. That, that's it. You don't do that. When you go on an adventure, man, you plan it out. We're going to go here. We're going to do that. Some people over plan it. They're doing everything every five seconds. Wear everybody out. I hate that. But, uh, you know, treat her like an adventure. See what she's capable of. What's inside her head in her heart you should be exploring her just like you'd explore a great adventure make a plan stick to the plan it's amazing women are fascinating amazing creatures and if all you notice about your wife is her outside you don't get this and by the way the outside at some point changes right you need to explore the girl inside. Who's in there? Who's behind those eyes? What is she really like? You know, because the outside changes. You know, gravity is a cruel thing. <laughs> Just, things keep getting longer and longer and longer. <laughs> Just, be, Just because of gravity, you know. And if all you know is the outside, you'll lose interest really fast. Treat her like an adventure. There's an amazing person in there. Find out who she is. Celebrate her. Plan with her. Treat her like a great adventure. What else we got? <laughs> Treat her like your doctor. Actually, let me read this to you. Uh, uh, let me read you from the book. Uh, which I have downloaded on my e-reader, which you can do yet tonight. All right, let's see. Treat him like, treat her like a truck. There it is. <laughs> All right, now. I'm not saying that every day of your marital life needs to feature a tearful bonding session like something you'd seen on Oprah. But I'm saying that at least on occasion you need to intentionally let her know what you're thinking and feeling just like you need to let your doctor know what you're feeling. Not just what you are struggling with in your life but also your hopes your dreams, your aspirations. She cannot help you achieve what you're reaching for if you don't let her know what it is. Can it be uncomfortable? Sure. But so can a visit to the doctor. I mean, when he's holding your balls in his hands and tells you to cough, that's a little uncomfortable. And in parentheses, I wrote, 
why do they do that anyway? I, I said, I suppose I could Google the answer, but I'm typing this on a flight at 30,000 feet, and I really don't want the lady next to me glancing over and seeing me pull up websites explaining the holding of balls. And don't get me started about the joys of a prostate exam. But why do we do these things? So we can live not only longer, but better. The doctor can't help you if all you ever say to him is, great, fine, super, sure, I guess. And neither can your wife. You say, but I'm a man and I, I don't need anybody to help me. Actually, that's not true. The Bible tells us in the beginning that he created Adam and put him in this glorious garden. And it didn't take long before the Almighty had the following observation. The Lord God said, it's not good for this guy to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. No sooner did God, no sooner did God create a man when he came to the very conclusion that this boy needs some help. Now that's not to say that men are stupid or idiots or incapable of rational thought, despite what is portrayed on television today. You know, when I was growing up, there were shows on TV called Father Knows Best and the Andy Griffith Show where men were portrayed not only as wise and insightful, but as protecting and caring. Not today, men are now portrayed as bumbling fools that are not only inferior to their wives, but to their children as well. Have you noticed this? Sometimes in some of these comical things, the kids are smarter than the parents. Ha, 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 ha. You know, it's not funny. They're tearing down institutions that should be built up. No, God wasn't saying that Adam was an idiot. He just was quick to realize that with the proper help, he was capable of doing incredible things. Generally speaking, men do better when they are not alone. The great King Solomon, referred to as the wisest man to ever live, had this observation. He said, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two, Solomon says, are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up but pity the one who falls and has no one to help you up. Treat her like your doctor. And if your doctor is going to help you at all, you have to be honest with him. And you have to be open. And you need to be a little vulnerable. You do it so you can live longer. I am stunned at how many men would rather die an early death than go see a doctor. And it's amazing how many men are like that. My father-in-law died of causes that were ridiculous. He didn't need to die at his age. Uh, he died of a tooth infection. Do you know that you can die just from if your teeth go bad, if you don't take care of them? It'll poison your system. It'll kill you. All he had to do was go to a dentist, but he would rather die than go to a dentist. There's guys like this. They just they hate it. Look, that's your choice if you want to do that. I'm just saying, if you want to live a long time, you go to the doctor. I go to the doctor. I do. I don't like it, but I, I want to live as long as I can and as healthy as I can and not live a miserable existence. If you let them know what you're struggling with, they can help you. If you don't let them know, there's not anything they can do for you. And the same when you're doing life with her. And then what do we got here? Last thing, bonus chapter. No, no, treat her like a waitress. <laughs> How do you treat your waitress? Most guys are very nice to the waitresses. Hey, sweetie, how you doing? Oh, thank you. Can you get me some more coffee? La, la. And guys know that when they're real nice to the waitresses, the waitresses are nicer back to them. Well, why not treat your wife like the waitress? You know? A little tip now and then wouldn't hurt you either. <laughs> you know, give her some special attention. Say nice things to her. I don't know why guys don't say nice things to their wives. I don't get it. You know, you want to win, you got to play the game. Say nice things to her, compliment her, 
Encourage her. You'd be surprised how much she comes to life. I mean, a lot of men don't even ever tell their wives they love them. Wouldn't surprise me if there's guys like that here. Well, I told you I loved you once. <laughs> if anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> Not helpful. All right. And then what's the last one? There it is. Bonus chapter. Do not treat her like your brother. All right. A lot of men like to gross out their wives with guy stuff. Don't do that. She's not your brother. Just like you're not her girlfriend. She's not your brother. Don't do gross things to her and gross her out and stick her head under the blankets <laughs> while you pass gas. You think it's funny. It's not funny to her. Don't do that to her. Some guys are nuts. I mean, seriously, I had a lady write me. I'm not making this up. You can't make up some of this stuff. She said, Pastor, my husband will go to the toilet. And if he's had a successful bowel movement, he comes to find me so I can see it. <laughs> hey, baby, come here. You ought to see the size of this thing. And I was like, well, really? <laughs> She's not your brother. Don't treat her like your brother. Treat her like a woman. All right. All right, questions now. What? questions can we come up with and it can be anything anything's fair game good evening hi this question is on behalf of all the women here where is the fine line between reminding and nagging? Reminding and nagging, the fine line. Oh, I don't know. I don't, know. I don't think that I'd be that obsessed by it. The reality is couples who get along really well are always reminding each other. I'm, have, you ever, have you ever seen this? They're, they're the ones that get along great. They're, hey, where's my kiss? Hey, you ready to give me a hug? Where's my hug? Oh, don't remember it. 44 years I was married to that redhead. Every week, she had to remind me to take out the garbage. You would think, being a semi-intelligent human being, that I would get the hang of that after a while. I never did. Now she's gone. I got garbage problems. I'm, I need a wife. I'm in trouble, man. I'm telling you, I don't function well. You know. Um, she never did it in a nasty way. She always did it. It was a smile. And she kind of would torture me. She would wait until I'm ready to climb into bed. Did you take out the garbage? Oh, man, you know, I put on my pants again and drag it out and stuff like that. But I didn't say, well, why would you quit nagging me? You know, there's no reason to get nasty at each other. I think the fine line is just an attitude, to be quite honest with you. An attitude where you're bitter that you have to remind them, and he gets bitter that you're doing any reminding, which was my point at the beginning. Don't get bitter about these things. Embrace them. If God Almighty had to do things to remind himself and responded when people would remind him of his promises, I think we can do the same. I don't think when you say, Lord, remember you promised such and such, he's up there saying, really, you got to remind me, you know, I'm not an idiot. He doesn't respond that way. He celebrates, oh, yes, and then I remembered my covenant with them. Oh, yes, I remembered my promise to them. That's how God works. So I think the fine line really is just an attitude. Don't resent it. Be nice about it. Make, make it fun. You know, the reason why women don't make it fun is they don't like having to remind them. You don't. I know. Women don't like having to repeat the same issues over and over and over again with a man. The ones who don't like that are the ones who get real bitter and angry at their husbands. 
the ones who don't have a problem with it, they laugh about it. They smile about it. My wife, if she were to hear today, she'd just tell you every week, I got to remind them to take out the garbage. And she never was bitter and angry about it. Don't get angry about these things. And it'll keep it from becoming nagging. I think it's, the fine line is really just an attitude. Embrace reminding each other. And even, even guys, you know, the other way around. A lot of guys usually are more interested in sex than their wives, right? That's kind of normal. There's exceptions. There's some marriages where the wife is more interested than the guy. Uh, if, if, if you're in a marriage where your wife is more interested in sex than you, I think I speak for all the men when I say that we hate you. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but even got, you know, they'll, they'll climb that and then they'll just get mad because she's not, she's not starting anything. Ugh. Don't do that. Just remind her, hey baby, Hey, baby, come here, you know. Now, you're not always going to win, but why get mad about it? They get mad. Roll over. Blah, 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 blah. She hasn't had sex in a week. Blah, I'm not so mad, bitter. Really? I say, wow, she can wait two weeks. Okay, that's her. I can't. I was usually the reminder. <laughs> Married to the remindee. And, uh, and, and you just did it. When you get bitter about it, again, couples who are always getting along great always remind each other, hey, baby, it's been a while. And she might say, oh, I don't feel like it. And you just go, that's okay, you will. <laughs> All right? I mean, why not have fun with stuff? People that need to lighten up. A guy gets mad because she can go a, a month and a half without sex. doesn't seem to bother her, and he's driving him crazy. They won't talk about it. I've, I brought it up three times. Really? I'm telling you, you're going to need to bring these things up forever until you die. The good news is you die. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I have a question. I hear a voice, but I can't see a body. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. Yes. Who is it? <laughs> um, okay. So in terms of um, speaking to your girlfriends. Okay, yes. I do try. <laughs> I have, I work a lot. So I generally don't have a lot of time to see them. So it lands up being a WhatsApp conversation, something like that. And he can't stand this. So I don't know when he can't I, stand what me he's speaking to them all the time, but he won't listen to me either. <laughs> so, go ahead. What? You have to forgive me. You guys speak in a different language than I speak. I, I, the, the accent throws me all the time. Okay. So, you work all the time. You don't have time for girlfriends. So you've got to talk. Yes. Yeah, so, so what I do um, sometimes they'll come with me while I work. I work for myself. Who work comes with you? My friends. So you bring your friends to work. I do. I'm lucky. <laughs> you can do that? I can. <laughs> I'm a photographer. It's easy. Who goes to work with anybody? <laughs> hey, guys, come here. Let's go to work. I ain't going to work with you. I'm, it's really I'm going to go lay down and take a nap. All right? So you actually invite girls to come to work, and they do it. Yeah, they come and they sit with okay. me while I'm busy working. So okay. that's how I'm able to see them. Okay. Or I don't see them. Okay. Um, or we'll talk over the phone. Okay. And... He gets so agitated about it. Why but do you get irritated by it? It's until like 12 o'clock at night. No, but, <laughs> but he won't listen to me. So I'm so but, but, but here's the thing. You have to understand. If she quits talking to the girlfriends, she's going to talk to you all the time. <laughs> and she's going to stick a straw in your brain and suck the life out of you. <laughs> You should thank God she's talking to girlfriends. <laughs> Give her an extra few hundred rand. Go take them somewhere. Have a nice time. <laughs> Seriously, I was just talking to a couple. They were getting ready to get married, and the boy announced that he didn't want her to spend any more time with her family. I mean, he's just an idiot. I don't know what he was thinking. And I'm talking to him on the phone. I'm trying to help him. Listen to me. You idiot, listen to me. If she doesn't talk to her family, well, she's talking to them all the time. I said, I don't know. But if that stops, 
who do you think she's going to talk to? <laughs> oh, never thought about that. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's a good thing. Okay, now, if you're overdoing it, and seriously, it's midnight, and you're still chatting, you know, just gently remind her, stop talking, all right? But, uh, you know, don't envy the girlfriend. That's a good thing that you can do that, and you can chat. All I know is if she can't chat, she's going to want to chat with you. There's no escaping. Either she talks to her girlfriends at midnight, or she talks to you at midnight. So, you know, got to work it out. You guys will be fine. It's fine. What do you do for a living? You're a photographer. Ah. So you could have been taking nice pictures of me this whole time. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi. So I'm recently married. Um, <laughs> two months. <laughs> two months? Yeah. <laughs> All right. How's it going? Great. Oh, good, good. <laughs> and also bad sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Anyway, um, so I'm kind of a weird one. I normally text everything that happens to me during the day. Uh -huh. So, yeah, my, my husband is always up to date as to what's happening if I'm having a bad time. I text it to him and I, I say I'm having a bad time and uh -huh. all of that. And I get that out of my system. So by the time I get home, I don't really want to talk anymore. Uh -huh. But then he comes back and he wants to tell me every single thing that happened to, to him during the day. And by the time I don't want to listen, like I just, I just want to cuddle or sleep. So how do I balance stuff like that? Because I try to make it easy by doing it throughout the day yeah what you're saying is to him why can't you be like me yeah welcome to marriage sunshine <laughs> why can't you be like me because i'm brilliant and you're mentally ill you know that's two months come on you're rookies this is just the beginning of sorrows all right <laughs> you're going to have to change. Nobody wants to change, right? So maybe you don't text everything to him so that maybe you can talk it with him later if he wants to talk it through. Look, you'll eventually find a, you know, a way to work it out. And it's, it's just painful. <laughs> it is. It is. There's, there's, look, you know, two months. How many of you have been married for... 20 years or more. Yeah. Okay, put your hands down. How many of that same group still have communication problems? Yeah, pretty much the same hands. You see, so... Yeah. So, uh, 20 years, two months. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. hang on. <laughs> Where's your husband, by the way? He's at home watching you. <laughs> He's home watching me online. Why isn't and he our here? Son. And you our slacker. Son. Oh, he's, he's watching the, your son. Got it. All right. We'll cut him some slack. <laughs> yeah, everybody's different. Here's the crazy thing about it is we always tend to attract people who are different than us. You know, these differences draw us to each other like a slow moving car wreck. <laughs> and then we drive each other crazy. And then I tell my seminars all the time. The number one argument in marriage is always, why can't you be more like me? And, that's a, and, and it's not. So you're going to have to learn to talk more. He's going to have to learn to talk less. And that's how you, that's how you do it. And it's pain. You do talk a lot. I don't, yeah. I, I thought I was loud enough, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do talk a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm a very audible, like I talk a lot. But um, I just don't like sharing things. I talk, but I don't like sharing. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, no, it doesn't actually. Yeah. <laughs> so like if I'm angry or I'm agitated. No, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I like to talk. I don't like to share. Yes. 
I'll talk what does that anything. mean? I'll talk about anything that's not important. But if it's important and it hits home, then... If it's not important, why would anybody want to listen to you? It's just driving a conversation, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to work this out. <laughs> it is what it is. I don't know. You don't want to share intimate things? Yes, I don't like You don't like sharing intimate no. things? Yeah. You know you're married. <laughs> you, you know, there's a lot of intimate things that go on, which we won't discuss. But uh, that's just part of it. There's physical intimacy. There's also emotional intimacy. There's even intellectual intimacy. You need to embrace all of it. Okay? And it takes time. Don't get frustrated. You know, it's two months. It's nothing. It really is. You know, I've always shocked by people that they say, you know, Pastor Mark, we've been married for a year and we're in hell. Pastor Mark, we've been married for six months, we're in hell. Worst one I got was, Pastor Mark, we've been married for two weeks and we're in hell. I think, really? It should take you years to get to hell. How are you getting to hell so fast? Just out of pure morbid curiosity, how old are you? 28. All right. How old is he? 36. Okay, so that's fine. Age, age, there's no problem with big age differences and stuff like that. Is, is the first marriage for him? Yeah. Yeah. One of the challenges, again, I'm not a big fan. I forget who are the couple I was talking to over here of this long dating and waiting to get married. One of the problems is the longer you're single, the harder it is to connect with somebody. It is. It just really is. Some of the hardest, there's people I've talked to that, you know, they're 50 years old and they get married for the first time and they are in hell. It's because they've been single all their lives. My advice, the younger you do that, the easier it is to connect with somebody. You get used to your life being a certain way as a single person. The longer you delay that, 36 years is a long time not to be married and not to suddenly be married and to get on the same page with you. It'll be, it'll be tough, but you can do it. Anybody can do anything. You'll be fine. You seem like a sweet lady. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, for me, it's an observation that one thing that I guess freaked me out in relationships is the ability to go from zero to 300 in less than two seconds. So the conversation starts as, how was your day? And it ends with you sleeping on the couch. <laughs> um, so just the, the escalation of things, you know, just... <laughs> Just a simple question, and it got escalated, and now you're talking about your father-in-law's problems and you, what you didn't do, and all you asked was, how's your day? So that's just interesting. Now, now she's the one who escalates it? Yes. Yeah. That's because she's a woman. All right? <laughs> now, and, and those of you who've seen my seminar, you remember the boxes and the wires? See, men's brains are made up of boxes, and we, we put things in boxes. And when we talk, we talk about what's in that box, one thing at a time. Women's brains are made up of wire, and everything is connected all at once. So when they start talking, they don't stay on one subject. They bring all of them in at once. And it's very confusing to a man. It really is. And uh, it is what it is. <laughs> do you do this late at night? No, any time of the day. Any time of the day. Yeah, just escalation, just, just yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't call it escalation. It's just the way they talk. They tend to connect everything. Welcome to marriage. 